All right, all right, all right. Dwayne Nash here, here to talk to you about my book, Dinosaur Enlightenment. If you haven't picked it up, what are you waiting for? I call it today's generation's answer to the dinosaur heresies, and I stand by that. But I also put I have to put it in its context of uh, where we are in the the history of dinosaurology, which I'll I'll get into it get into that in this video. Um, I also like to announce that I'm doing a signing at Bank of Books in my town of Ventura, uh, April 24th uh, from 1 to 3 p.m. So if you live in the uh, Southern California area or even Bay Area, you should come down. It's a great place to visit. Great food. Uh, walk along the promenade. And, you know, just come say hi, chat, and, uh, you know, I'll be there from 1 to 3. So come hang out. We can talk dinosaurs. I also want to announce that I'm well into my next tome, which uh, fittingly is titled Plesiosaur Machinations. Um, and it, it is uh, a continuation of the, of the same blog series where I... Or a, I pulled together the ideas I, I developed there, including some new ones and some larger scale um, evolutionary ideas I have with marine reptiles and marine ecosystems in the Mesozoic. Um, and I also uh, am pleased to announce that I was able to pull together some funds to uh, collaborate with some very talented and uh, diverse uh, artists in that project. So. Uh, so I will be supporting uh, and trying to, in the future, support more paleo artists as much as I can. So, you know, purchasing my products helps the, you know, the whole chain of, uh, of, of talent out there, which there is a, uh, as anyone on, on Twitter or on uh, DeviantArt notices, there is a uh, super abundance of, uh, of talent out there. So it should all have some outlet, you know, even if you, even if you can't do it professionally, um, uh, it, you know, it's a great, uh, you should definitely cultivate that passion throughout your lifetime. So hopefully this becomes, um, I plan on making it kind of an ongoing series, um, as part of my continuing, uh, promotion of this book. I think my book will be a little bit like my, uh, like my blog, Anti-Deleavian Salad, is it is kind of a, a sleeper hit over time and, uh, you know. It'll it'll build as fallen over time and and people will, will come around to it over 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 time. It's not a uh, I'm not easily digested. Let's say um, so. I start off with uh, of course old sexy Rex himself, T Rex in the book. Uh, I titled the chapter uh, Paleontology's favorite to uh, chew toy uh, because uh, you can't escape the discussion of T-Rex with anything to do with, with old bones and dinosaurs especially. And as much as people invested in dinosaurology might lament this fact, everyone begrudgingly admits that, that uh, the T-Rex, you know, here's a, here's a, a, a old vintage uh, Rex uh, that went to Mardi Gras and cut some beads. Um, er, Everyone will admit they're pretty cool animals, and T-Rex is kind of the. It, it, it's cool because it's the last one right before the, uh, you know, right before the uh, extinction event. So it, it kind of fits in a neat narrative arc. So I make I and I made in in my blog series the argument that T-Rex is best imagined, and the data fits it as a somewhat specialized. Um, nocturnal ambush hunter, especially of, of, of sleeping and resting dinosaurs, that it really put its panoply of, of, of senses, especially hearing um, and smell, uh, to really give it the advantage, advantage in, in, in low light conditions. And in this way, um, mirrors and, and kind of parallels a lot of actually aquatic predators a lot of uh, of sharks of the gen of, of the genus somniosis that are actually able to um capture and subdue much more quicker and agile prey by just being very stealthy and very slow moving so as much as and i discuss this in the book as much as i grew up um you know kind of a fanboy of Gregory paul and bacher and the whole T-Rex running 45 miles per hour, I do have to kind of dash that image aside, and I, and I think 
And we're seeing more and more of this science showing this that while probably, yeah, definitely agile and, and, and probably T-Rex could outpace the average human today, it wasn't a a hyper cursorial animal the way we think of it today. And uh, I don't really think the, um, the hypothesis that it was a pursuit predator, uh, just kind of herring prey for long distance, I don't think it really maps out well i don't think it will map out well uh with the with the um the plus and minus of energy expenditure especially as i agree with dave hone that a lot of these theropods were probably mainly eating and this is this is ecologically sound with the reproductive strategy of dinosaurs that a lot of the biomass was in the younger immature animals so Engaging in pursuit for miles and miles on end after a, a, a cow or sheep-sized animal is just not going to, in my estimation, and I don't think there's been I don't think there's been any deliberate studies done on this. I don't think it will map out well as far as uh, as as ener energy expenditure go. I also don't agree with as much as I used to like it in the past, and it was, it's a very exhilarating idea that. The T. Rex hunted in these organized packs, and that the, and that the young animals would have the duty of kind of corralling and and shepherding prey into the waiting jaws of, of larger, uh, more more mature animals with devastating bites. We just don't. It's a very complex uh, scenario here, and we never see this in even in in organized group hunting animals or mammals or even our own species where it's the youngest, most experienced animals have the most um, responsibility and and you could say the most involved uh, part of this whole scenario. So I, I really lean into the ambush predator hypothesis, what I call the night stalker rex. And I think this is the culmination of, of, of this behavior and other uh, tyrant lizards prior to Rex. I just think Rex got it the got it done the best. And in that way really escaped the bounds of limitations as far as far as robusticity and, and girth goes. So you, you know you look at, at, at Rex compared to even um, other large theropods that just had this robo huge girth to it. Looking and, and mimicking almost like giant marine at mammals they, they could really just blow out their their torso and so i think uh rex had really escaped the confines of what we consider um ideal ad adaptations for land-based terrestrial predators and i think especially with more um remote cameras and 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 and, and kind of investigation of nocturnal predators i think we'll see a, and we're seeing this already with a lot of a lot of evidence of, 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 of owls, for instance, attacking roosting birds, even roosting other raptors. Um, it's been well documented that, that the crocodiles will come onto land at night and will map out and kind of anticipate where prey is on land and have even like ambushed humans that are sleeping in tents. So, so this is well established behavior in even modern archosaurs that that the the cloak of night gives significant advantages to to predators and there is even some reference i'm making the book i figure out what what vitamin it is might be, might be vitamin a or k but but predators have an advantage in nocturnal vision even uh that that herbivores simply can't can't meet uh because of the of the uh of the abundance of this vitamin in, in animal in animal um in you know in, in eating animal product product <laughs> and eat, you know in, in eating animal matter they get more of this vitamin than herbivores do so they have a natural uh, advantage at night which should not be understated and I actually make make the analogy the best if you really want to imagine a T-Rex foraging and moving through its landscape uh, look at birds like the kiwi um, uh, Rex definitely had I mean, it's definitely well established that it probably had really good vision, but I think it could survive even with diminished uh, 
vision just on its acuity and smell and hearing alone. So very scary predator. Um, and and when we, sh we have to, and I do this in the book, before I get to that, I, I go over the ontogeny of, of Rex and, and why it's, it's kind of um, development would al allow for this kind of specialized predator. Uh, before I do, before I get there, I, I kind of make a, I kind of embed the introduction in the first chapter, if you didn't notice, and I kind of lay out uh, my seven, was it seven? Yeah, seven, eight, my eight kind of guided metrics that I use to kind of corral my thinking, because contrary to proper popular belief, I don't just throw, I throw a lot of stuff at the wall, but I kind of corral it and I called it kind of um, my my bounded specula speculation approach um, before we get there though <coughs> excuse me let's get into where we are in the uh, in kind of the sequence of dinosaur studies if you imagine and this is kind of a caricature but if you imagine before the dinosaur renaissance you call that like kind of the dinosaur middle ages or dark ages there was kind of just like kind of like a you know this is the classic brontosaurus in the swamp the kind of vertical stance theropods um kind of just so storytelling which 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 happens and you know i'm probably guilty of that too but um and so then we have you know balker and ostrom and all these figureheads coming along <coughs> But even with them, we're kind of guilty in falling in love with, you might say, the kind of cult of personality of, of these paleo luminaries, uh, including myself, um, the kind of swashbuckling, uh, you know, Renaissance man. And so things maybe shift a little bit too far as far as like every dinosaur has to be extremely hot blooded. Um, uh, there probably was more, well, there definitely appears to be more middle tier kind of metabolisms. Um, uh, 45 mile per hour or even 35 mile per hour multi-ton theropods or hadrosaurs seems to be kind of on the wane. So there was kind of definitely an overreach of the Renaissance who so kind of fell in love with it. And, um, you know, that's encapsulated with the uh, predatory dinosaurs of the world which in my book, I make kind of an homage to the, the introduction in this book with a, with a T-Rex ambush. I make my own homage to that in, in my book. Um, and uh, of course, the classic dinosaur heresies. For the longest time, I never actually owned a copy of this book. I just had checked out the library so often I had it memorized. And I, I found it used for a dollar. And what's cool in the bookstore is uh, Robert Bacher's signature was in the book. So got his signature for a buck, basically. That's pretty cool. So those are two kind of good foundational texts to understand the Renaissance, the dinosaur Renaissance. Um, what, is, what is still in kind of our near view vision is what I call the, the scientific maturation of dinosaur studies. And that's really putting a more hypothesis driven testable data aspect of dinosaur studies and that i think is best encapsulated in, in, a, in a magazine article by national geographic um and so this was uh this was definitely like the the larry whitmer thomas holtz era of dinosaur studies and uh that was definitely needed you know there's, there's always this kind of push and pull between the more esoteric kind of speculative and the more harder grounded primary data so the uh, scientific maturation which is um, we're still in the kind of <coughs> um, you know I, 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 I don't really exp express this but I I mean you'll read in the book what I say about it but I think that we sometimes fall in love with Oh, this has this could have a quantitative aspect to it, and this has new numbers behind it, and that's great. But you really have to look sometimes: is the data? Are you too myopic in your in your vision of things? Um, and I, I give several examples of that in this book: how we sometimes fall in love with like, oh, this has data and graphs attached to it; it must be the real science. Um, 
but you know what they say if, if, if the data you put in is shit or not seen in the proper context you get the data out is also shit and so segueing from that is kind of the return of, 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 of speculation and you can't you can't not mention all yesterday's and uh, I mentioned this in the book, but I probably would not have written, I definitely probably not have written this book or got back into, because I fell out of love with science for a while and dinosaurs, uh, but it was really touch upon zoology and all yesterday's, it kind of reawakened my interest in it, uh, for better or worse. And uh, yeah, so definitely all yesterday's is a segue into books like mine. And this really asked the question of speculation has always been there. It's always going to be there. It plays a big role. What is that role and how do we kind of uh, negotiate that with the science? And that is the phase we're kind of moving into uh, away from the scientific maturation into what I call the dinosaur enlightenment. And, um, and that is where I get into my kind of bounded speculation approach. So the first kind of ru rule or guideline I ab abide by is the deconstruction of scientific and cultural pedigrees. And, uh, you know, so dinosaurs and other charismatic prehistoric animals have a kind of mythology and lore to them. They represent much more than just the sum of their parts, in my estimation. They are kind of, in a way, modern archetypal dragons, in a sense. So there, there is a, a realistic myth-making about them. Uh, which I get to infer later in the chapters. Uh, my second kind of guideline is that nature abhors a vacuum. If there is an open ecological slot, something will probably move in to take that slot. So you always want to be looking at dinosaurs or other prehistoric animals within the context of their larger environmental and ecological systems. Uh, my third guideline is to pay attention uh Looking at the tug and pull of, of adaptationists and adaptationist and pluralistic approaches uh, approaches to to understand these animals and, and their anatomy, um, and I've came out negative on Gold uh, Stephen Jay Gold's uh, Spandrels of San Marcos in the past, but the more I look, I, I do see examples of, of of where things we interpret as having meaning can just be uh, other factors coming together to make to make them this uh, this pluralistic approach uh, versus the adaptationist approach which I generally kind of lean more to, or towards the adaptationist which is okay I just think people should really look at where their bias lies I, I, I think people might shift one one way more or the other in their interpretations of animals so it's okay to, 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 to argue for both and I, I do that um, my fourth guideline is best fit analogies. You want to try to find analogs in modern or recent ecosystems that might best fit uh, how you're interpreting this animal. Uh, my fifth guideline is the role of future evolution. And this is a um, Dougal Dixon kind of spearheaded this Scottish um, uh, uh, thinker, uh, kind of spearheaded this, this movement of imagining how evolution might run into the run in the future and this is very useful actually towards looking at animals in the past i believe what it does is is you kind of you train the circuit when you start to imagine future evolution you train the circuitry in your brain to hopefully think of the most parsimonious and and easily delineated sequence of events that might lead to like uh, a predatory ground-based bat for instance and that could also be used in reverse. Um, so if you know the precursor of a certain species, you could kind of imagine what it might turn into and vice versa. So, so the kind of the muscles you flex in thinking in the future can also be used to think backwards too. So uh, don't be smirch or, or disavow future evolution and, and, and how important it is, it is for thinking about um, evolution and paleontology. Um, the hypothesis you make should be consistent with the uh, available data. And if, it, if it's not, you need to say why it 
betrays his data or what went wrong in that initial data. And kind of my seventh and eighth kind of guidelines are, and you still see this to this day, is is avowed, you know, respected paleontologists will say, oh, this, if they can't explain a certain feature or, or adaptation of an extinct animal, they'll describe it as, oh, this is just an evolutionary experiment or a transition species. I don't really like that. I think it's kind of a... I think it's kind of just a uh, an excuse for not not really having the creativity or the data to come up with a plausible scenario, lifestyle scenario. And so, what I prefer to think about is that look at the words world's modern biota. If evolutionary experiments and transitional species were so common in the past, where are they today? If you look around, most animals are more or less pretty competent in, in their lifestyle. You wouldn't call them uh, experiments. They're just good enough to fit into their niche. And so what I prefer to think about is this idea of, of a, a stepping stone uh, trans, uh, transition. If, if in... If in, a, if in if, if an opportunity, uh, if an opportunity uh, arises in an environment, uh, then animals will move in to fill that niche and 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 do so in a way that's not they're not they're not negatively adapted. A, a perfect example it would be like a sea otter. A sea otter is not as pelagic or as fast swimming as a sea lion or or a you know, some other pinniped or, or, or dolphin, but it's good enough to go scrounge up, um, you know, clams and urchins and crabs on the seafloor. It's it's not, it, it can eventually transition to into a more pelagic, you know, lifestyle. But right now, you know, you know, living in the kelp forests or in estuaries, sea otters are doing just fine. They're not predetermined to transition into something else. So, you know, when we look at prosauropods, um, we don't have to imagine them as, as less fully realized versions of ladder, ladder sauropods. They're just actually very competent and good at doing what they're doing right then and there in their environment. There, there's no uh, storyline that they need to, they need to fill. Um, so those are my kind of guided metrics for uh, bounded speculation. So I kind of embed the introduction into the into this into the story of Sexy Rexy, and Sexy Rexy itself has a bit of a you know a masculine appeal with that strong jawline, the thick you know jutting chin, and um, you know as as I argue in later chapters, there is kind of a even a gender based archetypal mythology that that kind of resonates with us in in, in these dinosaurs um, later on in the book when I get to the uh, the dromies the dromiosaurs I I argue that they they evoke a more of a, a feminine archetypal energy as opposed to the masculine energy of, of, of t-rex um, so to see t-rex as a specialized nocturnal ambush predator you need to look at its Ontogeny, and we know they lived, um, you know, they could get up to, you know, they started reaching maturity around like 18, 20 years of age, got up to maybe 30 years. And it's often argued, even by paleontologists, that they had a, a live fast, die young, you know, really rapid lifestyle. But there aren't any large predators today, land-based predators that live really over 20 years. You know, it's rare to see them live that long. So Rex is actually living longer than 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 most uh, than all large mammalian land-based predators. I don't think there are any, <coughs> unless you count us and like chimpanzees and stuff like that. I can't think of any canids or felids or even bears that, outside of captivity, regularly exceed 20 years of age. So. Uh, so it had a little bit more of a lifespan than, 
you know, a longer time to accumulate things than, than modern mammalian predators. And what I th find fascinating, a lot of things are featured, a lot, a lot of fixation is on that transition from the, the kind of teenage middle years, that rapid growth phase. That's interesting, but more interesting to me is the initial third, the, the childlike, what I call the, the wonder years of T-Rex, uh, the kind of um, child phase of T-Rex. Now, why would an animal uh, at that size, where it's very vulnerable, why would it uh, suspend growing up? Um, why, why would it delay maturation? There's another species that does this. Uh, that's us. We suspend. Uh, we suspend our maturation, and the the most uh, plausible hypothesis is that we need to accumulate information and data about our own culture before we 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 uh, engage in in more mature adult responsibilities. So we we have kind of a childhood, and T. Rex did too. What I argue is in this book is that those wonder years would have been marked by an intense curiosity in these uh, juvenile child rexes, and they would have been getting into all kinds of trouble. They could get out of trouble because they were small and nimble enough that they pissed off a large hadrosaur or a cer ceratopsid. They could get out of harm's way, which would not be so much the case when they got larger and bulkier. Um, because these large other dinosaurs that, that T-Rex was confronting, even the massive Edmontosaurus was a was no pushover, could do uh, deliberate and devastating damage to even adult Rexes. So the, the childlike phase allowed them to collect data in their environment. And what they were especially ar argue cued into would have been the movement patterns, the nesting patterns, the foraging patterns, the sleeping patterns, the reproductive patterns of all these other animals that later in life would form the bulk of their prey. As a youngster, they could get around scavenging small prey items, whatever. It, you know, they, they were not under the burden of, of having to feed such a large growing body in these initial, you know, five, 10 years of life. That comes in the teenage years. And this is a very critical and, and devastating for many individuals phase their life because they had to have acquired enough data during those initial childlike years to start to segue into being a successful uh, specialized ambush predator. Not only that, but they were under pressure, under potentially under predation pred pressure from other larger rexers, rexes that wanted to eliminate the the competition, both for reproductive and uh, and um, caloric resources. So there was likely a differential survival rate among uh, male and female rexes at this time, and I would argue that the female rexes could move away from other large female rexes and would still be courted by large male rexes. However, maturing um, male rexes had a, had a bigger jeopardy because not only were they being targeted by other um, mature male rexes, they were competing with each other. So I think at the end of this teenage phase, there'd be more females left over than males. And coming into, into adulthood, we might even see a peculiar situation where females may have competed for territory and access to the rarer large male rexes. And this this goes along with this idea of, of dual sexual selection, uh, which I know has been brought forth before by people like Darren Nash, and uh, um, you know, I think it's very robust. I think we went down the wrong path expecting there to be this ontogeny in dinosaurs. But because of their reproductive and ontogenetic sequences, I think we'll see that there's a lot more to be said for uh, dual sexual selection because females have their own hierarchy um, and they'd have to compete for the best territories and the best nesting sites. 
Nesting sites are crucial and a huge differential from the pressures that like large mammals face, where they're not as tied down to defending a large nesting site and also putting their nesting site in, there, in an area with good resources for their young. So uh, dual sexual selection is kind of somewhat intersecting but somewhat separate hierarchy in the in the in the sexes which i think is also another similarity that we share with with t-rex and dinosaurs we have a female and male hierarchy that somewhat intersects but is also kind of exclusive to each gender and that's also found in other primates too so you know again we see these kind of eerie similarities between um, humans and dinosaurs and I think that's a, a fascinating avenue that I don't shy away from the, in this book um, and so then when we finally get to the adult years this is where uh, um, the the reproductive arsenal really comes into play and uh, the, the growth is kind of slowed they've reached maturation and now the the name of the game is 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 carrying on your gene uh, gene line so for females, this would probably mean establishing a ter territory, a territory with abundant prey, especially reproducing prey. So having nesting colonies within your territory would be a good thing, and highly, com you know, highly they'd be highly competed, com competitive over that over this, um, because other females are are are, are going to be competitive because they want their offspring to have the best chance to grow up. Um, so I don't think female Rexes were very nice to each other. Uh, same with male Rexes were probably not, not nice to each other. And it was probably a situation the way where you see female territories spliced apart and you might have one male kind of roaming over this whole kind of swath of land and, and kind of, um, trying to corral, try to interface with as many female territories as you can similar to uh to mountain lions or pumas cougars what you, you what you might say i don't think t-rex had prides or packs or anything like that i just don't think it would map out especially if as i agree with with dave hone they were probably mainly eating uh you know the cow-sized offspring um and and this 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 goes in line with a lot of the data in um in what we're seeing with the with the uh, representation of ad adult fossils where t-rex seems particularly abundant adult t-rex was almost as common as as these other animals that were its prey base and even more common than animals like ankylosaurus and so and i get further into this the dynamics of of dinosaur populations in these uh our strategy kind of the fast clock and the slow clock i get more into that in later chapters we'll get into later but that kind of summarizes the first chapter um and i've, I've talked i talked about it in my blog too but the night stalker rex uh is i think a very robust hop hypothesis and i think it fits the data quite nicely so uh i'm gonna end it there um Again, read the book. If you have any questions or thoughts about the chapter, let me know in the uh, in the comments. And uh, again, April 24th at Bank of Books of Ventura, I'll have a book signing. So come check it out. Hang out at Ventura. Lots of great shops. We have some of the best um, uh, thrift stores in, in California. So you, you could make it a day. Come, come eat. Go to the beach too. Walk on the promenade. Go down the pier. Um, great city and a cool bookstore too. Come, come say hi and check out Ventura. Peace out.